Welcome to this brief introduction to safety instrumented systems in the process industries. My name is Paul Grun. I'm with Rockwell Automation. I've been a member of the ISA 84 committee, the group that wrote the standard on this subject. Uh, I've been a member for 25 years. I'm the developer and instructor for the ISA courses on this subject and the primary author of the ISA book on this subject. First off, a basic definition. What is a safety instrumented system? It is a system that consists of sensors, a logic solver, and final elements designed to take the process or the equipment to a safe state if certain conditions are violated. Now it's the control system, and we're being generic with the acronym here, a basic process control system, that is an active dynamic system controlling temperature, pressure, level, flow, and all the other variables. How many of you believe the control system is perfect and will never fail? Well, everything fails, it's just a matter of when. So what will you do to maintain safety in your process when control loops fail or any other problems develop? So industry has long used additional systems for safety that have had a variety of names and could be any technology. The safety instrumented system could be relays or solid state systems that don't use software or programmable systems, but they are dormant passive monitoring systems that are not controlling temperature, pressure, level, and flow. They are monitoring those variables and again will take the process or the equipment to a safe state when certain conditions are violated. There have been a variety of names for these systems. ESD has been around for a long time, which most people take as emergency shutdown systems, but electrical engineers, to them, that means electrostatic discharge, so we need to be careful with acronyms. So where are these systems used? Well, any high-risk process industry in general. It's easy in the U.S. that the U.S. regulation uh, from OSHA, Occupational Safety and Health Administration, as a result of several serious accidents in the late in the 80s, basically, we had uh, OSHA release the PSM, Process Safety Management Regulation, for highly hazardous chemicals in 1992. That regulation applies to any facility with 10,000 pounds or more of flammable materials, combustibles, or certain levels of toxics, which is typically the high-risk industries, as the standard also has a similar definition, oil and gas chemical, petrochemical, these sort of things. OSHA estimates that's 25,000 facilities in the U.S. alone. There are similar regulations in other countries as well, and the various regulations would expect you to follow your industry standards, and various standards have been developed on this subject. So what have been some of the accidents and the changes in industry around the world? Well, well, it's interesting going through what these accidents were actually due to. That, that would actually take quite a bit of time. But the point is, in the UK, when it happened, regulations changed and said you had to do process safety studies and such. In Italy, then there was the uh, Seveso Directive that applied to the entire European community where you have to do similar safety cases and... Obviously, the intent is, after there's public outrage and government outrage, we don't want these sort of events happening anymore. We certainly don't need things like Bull Paul, where upwards of 10,000 people have died. And industry needs to operate safely by following various standards. But the point of these accidents is regulations around the world changed, all over the world. And they continue to evolve and change as well. Now, none of these particular events were due to control and safety system failures, but control and safety systems do fail, as we'll see on the next slide. But the point of these accidents were regulations around the world changed, and regulations refer you to standards that you need to follow, and standards have been developed in this area. So what have been some of the events? Now, uh, the United Kingdom Health and Safety Executive reviewed 34 accidents that were directly the result of control and safety system failures and documented their findings so the rest of the world could learn from this. I'll show you the book as the slide builds. They found the majority of accidents could have been prevented. The majority were due to incorrect and incomplete specifications, where the system did exactly what it was programmed and designed to do, but that was wrong on day one. 
and the brief introduction here we're going through in 20 minutes time does not allow full description and examples of all of these changes after commissioning and startup that uh, one person made a what they thought was a minor insignificant change but it was not properly reviewed and documented and bad things have happened design and implementation where the specification is correct but the system was not built properly and was not thoroughly tested to have found the problem some operation and maintenance issues and installation and commissioning problems now this was the book first published in 1995 out of control why control systems go wrong and how to prevent failure a very interesting read a second edition published around 2002 and we realize in industry that all of these pieces of the pie are important and if we are going to develop guidelines and standards we need to address all of these issues and we have with the various documents that have been produced so what have been some of these different documents over time well, almost 30 years ago the United Kingdom Health and Safety Executive wrote a book on programmable software-based systems for use in safety now this document is out of print but it, it was a very good document and did form somewhat the basis for many other documents that were produced after that as a result of the Bhopal India accident the American Institute of Chemical Engineers formed the Center for Chemical Process Safety the point of that group is to write guideline books by industry for industry several of those almost three dozen books do cover safety system topics now these are guideline books not mandated standards but they're very very good and some of these people or members of this committee also participate in standards committees such as within ISA now ANSI is the American National Standards Institute that oversees how ISA creates standards and ISA is the International Society of Automation created the first edition of ISA 84 back in 1996 now there is a second edition of the standard which is actually one of the international standards the IEC International Electrotechnical Commission of which the US participates and members of the IC 84 committee are members of the IEC committees the first standard uh, on functional safety that they developed was in a seven part document released between 98 and 2000 it took time and all these standards take about 10 years to create and the second edition of that standard came out in 2010. Now that standard is really viewed as the one for manufacturers, the vendors to follow in the build and manufacture and design of their equipment. The users in different industries follow different standards. In process, it's the 61511 standard, which was first released in 2003 and was adopted by ISA, adding one sentence to it. Uh, hence, we call it ISA 84 in parentheses IEC 61511 mod, mod for modified with one sentence and there are other standards for people to use in the machinery industry in the transportation in medical and nuclear so the process industry document as we'll see here in a moment is IEC 61511 which is again same thing as IEC 84 so what is the scope of this standard well it covers cradle to grave as we'll see here with the life cycle the specification design installation operation maintenance testing management of change decommissioning everything involved with the safety system which will certainly involve the user as well as contractors and system integrators and consultants operators engineers managers technicians everybody has some portion of some of the work involved with the safety system it has the life cycle of all the activities that need to be done but it does not mandate who does what the user will need to manage and oversee everything but certain contractors may do certain work or oversee or assist with certain work um, the engineering firm the system integrators all sorts of people have various responsibilities and this is the basic definition it's in the standard of the process industries chemicals oil refining oil and gas production as you can read so what is the life cycle what are the steps that need to be done well there are certain requirements that are described in the standard but it does not give the details of how to actually do it because there are plenty of other books or standards on some of those topics but there are certain areas where the standard then does get into specific details for example the hazard and risk assessment <clears throat> is to identify all the things that can go wrong so you can identify then the inputs and outputs and logic of your safety system to prevent those hazardous events from happening 
The risk assessment identifies obviously levels of risk. The higher the level of risk, the better the systems you need to control it. This will eventually lead us to SIL, safety integrity levels, the level of performance we need of the safety functions that we have identified doing these sort of studies. What other safety layers might we have from containment vessels to uh, scrubbers and rupture disks and flare systems and safety instrumented systems and fire and gas systems and all sorts of stuff. And these are typically the responsibility of the process designers, the process folks, not the instrument and control folks. So again, the standard does not give in, get into details of how to do these particular steps, but it does say they need to be done. Then, when we are going to now have safety instrumented functions, we need to have the details uh, of the specifications called the safety requirements specification. Probably the two most important pages in the standard, basically identifying about 24 bullet points of, of details that need to be specified for each and every safety instrumented function. Response time requirements and how are you going to do bypasses and the level of performance you need and all sorts of stuff. Then the detailed engineering for the designers and builders of the hardware and the software. How do you engineer and put the system together to do what the requirements call for? You have to install it. You have to commission it. You have to validate, which means comparing the system against the original specification to make sure they both match. Then there has to be operation procedures on how do you operate everything. There has to be maintenance procedures on how do you test everything. At some point, there will be changes made that has to be managed properly and even taking a system out of service. And there are some steps that apply throughout all of this. Naturally, management must oversee and make sure everything is being done. As Trevor Kletz famously said, all accidents are due to bad management. Not meaning bad evil, just meaning bad incompetent, incapable, not doing things as they should be done. And there has to be audits and assessments to make sure things are actually being done properly. And verification means checking that each and every phase or step of the life cycle was done, that you had the information you needed to do it properly, that you did the step properly, and you produced the right documentation that others will need for their steps in the life cycle. Part one of the standard is the normative mandatory portion. Part two is informative and explains all the clauses in part one. And part three is informative and describes the different SIL selection techniques. There are about four or five different techniques described in very brief summary, one of them being the risk graph, which is the easiest to cover in a short period of time with one slide. It's not the most common technique, but it is used. Now, this is an example for personnel risk uh, there could be similar risk graphs for environmental impact as well as commercial impact monetary losses as well. Let's take an example where there might be an overpressure explosion with multiple fatalities. And the words, the columns uh, on the right, uh, the words are too vague to use effectively. It's just trying to show the concept. So let's walk through an example where we might have an explosion and 20 people die. 20 people, I think we can consider many deaths. So we're on the lower left line C sub D. Then we look at, well, what's the frequency and exposure of these people to this event? Now, they're not normally standing next to the vessel 24-7, so let's say their exposure is rare to frequent. So now we move up to the FA line. Then we look at the possibility of the people being able to avoid this event. Now, factors to consider would be uh, what alarms and indicators are there to be aware that there's anything wrong, what procedures do people have to know what to do, what time do they have to respond? What evacuation routes do they have to go to a safe haven? A variety of things to consider. And let's say that it is sometimes possible. So we move up to the PA line. And then we consider the probability of this event actually occurring. Basically, what's the demand rate on the safety function? How often might this event happen? Now, this is the vaguest wording here, which causes all sorts of problems. Again, you can't use words that are this vague. But let's just say we have the middle column slight. Well, if you followed all that through, you come to the box that says SIL 2, safety integrity level 2. Well, what does that mean? The standard is a performance-based standard. It does not mandate technologies, levels of redundancy, test intervals, or anything else. 
If you say you need SIL2, then you need to document that your system has a probability of failure on demand within the range shown on this slide. Now, PFD for probability of failure on demand, not to be confused with process flow diagram or personal flotation device, PFD numbers are very small, and they're usually expressed in scientific notation, which even engineers make mistakes with. And with the original 1996 version of the standard, we had one minus that, that we called safety availability, not to be confused with the generic term availability, which people still confused it with, hence we no longer have that term. We finally got rid of it with the second edition of the standard, because nobody saw it endless stream of nines and any difference between them. But if we have a risk reduction factor, which is one over the PFD, everyone would see the difference between 30, 300, 3000. That's clearly easy to see orders of magnitude difference here. So what does it take to design for SIL1, SIL2, and SIL3? Well, the standard does have a lot of detail that I don't have time to cover in this brief introduction. There are fault tolerance tables and safe failure fraction and all sorts of other issues, but then the students in the longer courses do get to model and analyze all of these different choices shown here, most of them. And SIL 1, uh, assuming this is basically a cookbook, so based on a single sensor, two process lines we have to stop flow on, and at least yearly testing, we can do calculations to show that SIL1 you can do with simplex non-redundant stuff. Switches or transmitters, it really won't matter. Just about any logic technology and solenoid operated valves, everything's just fine. SIL2 starts to get difficult and expensive. One company has documented it's a good $40,000 plus per function to design SIL2 because you typically need fault tolerant, which is a better word than redundant, fault tolerance sensors, and final elements. So you'll typically have one out of two sensors, most commonly transmitters, but switches could still give you this level of performance. You'll typically at this point rule out general purpose PLCs as most will not meet the requirements. And you'll have two valves in series for each line that you have to stop, stop flow on. Now, the key for high SIL isn't necessarily fault tolerance, it's diagnostics. And you can get diagnostics with transmitters. There are safety certified transmitters that have higher levels of diagnostics, and you can do that with one safety transmitter. Ooh, potentially save a lot of money, easier system design. You can get similar diagnostics by comparing your safety transmitter with the control transmitter and compare the two, which again is for diagnostic purposes, and you might be able to achieve SIL2 that way with a single transmitter. To get diagnostics out of the valve, it usually involves partial stroking, which some people have had success with and others have not. SIL3, the standard design, is going to be triplicated analog transmitters because um, uh, switches won't get you that level of performance. And it's typically dual valves either with very frequent testing, like quarterly, or triplicated valves, which I don't see very often, or dual valves with partial stroking, which I don't see at all. So you can see SIL3 is going to be even more expensive. Now, using a logic solver that is certified for use in SIL3 does not give you SIL3, because if you have such a logic solver but a single switch and a single valve, you have a SIL1 design. That's what this table is trying to remind people of, as well as the fault tolerance tables that are actually in the standard. But don't get me wrong, I'm not trying to say there's no point or no use of having certified for use in SIL3 logic solvers. There is, but that's another long story. To learn more about this particular topic, the first suggestion would be to read the standard. Now, the standard is not written to teach, although part two of the standard is informative and the 84 committee has written almost a thousand pages of additional technical reports on various topics. To learn more about this, you can also read the ISA book, which is designed to teach. And ISA has courses on this subject as well. And if you attend any of these courses from ISA, you get all three parts of the standard and you get the book. So I hope you enjoyed and got something out of this introduction to safety systems. Thanks for your viewing.